Hi, everybody. Welcome to this KVM Forum 2020 presentation about managing guest memory using Rude.io. My name is David Hildenbrand, and today with me, I'm giving this talk with Michael Zirkin. Hi, I'm Michael Zirkin. I'm distinguished engineer at Red Hat. Okay, so let's get started. What do we actually mean when we talk about managing guest memory? So uh, usually there are uh, four different things we want to achieve uh, with our virtual uh, memory of our guest. First of all, we often want to speed up migration. So if you take a look at a virtual machine from the hypervisor point of view, any memory is possibly uh, worth migrating because it might contain important data. But in reality, there is often quite some memory sitting inside virtual machines that is actually not worth migrating. For example, if it's simply free memory. Of course, it's not that easy to uh, identify that memory from the hypervisor and uh, be sure that you don't lose any important data when migrating. So you need some kind of uh, handshake uh, with your guest. The second item is that we often have overcommitment of memory uh, and we want to avoid host swapping by any means. That means whenever our hypervisor is running out of memory, instead of going to swap, we much rather want to temporarily steal unused memory from virtual machines. Because in practice, it happens quite often that some virtual machines have quite some unused or free memory lying around that we can use uh, instead of swapping. The third item is that uh, we often want to control or shrink the page cache in the virtual machine and also sometimes other caches. Um, the nature of a modern operating system is that uh, it will try to make best use of all available memory, um, and that implies using it for caches. In Linux, this is, for example, done by the page cache, which will essentially, over time, uh, consume most of your main memory. But of course, uh, some data and caches can be dropped without affecting any workload. Uh, but from a hypervisor point of view, it's ab absolutely not clear which memory uh, that might be used for a cache inside a virtual machine can actually be dropped. And there's also like no real interface uh, to drop these caches. And last uh, but not least, uh, we often want to dynamically resize virtual machine memory. That means we want to hot plug or hot unplug memory from virtual machines, either automatically, um, for example, if our virtual machine runs out of memory or manually by user request. And this also needs some kind of collaboration uh, with the guest cooperation um, to make it work. Now, the uh, traditional mechanism to um, do uh, all of these things is memory ballooning. And um, just to give you a recap of what memory ballooning actually is, it can be summarized as relocating physical memory between a virtual machine and its hypervisor. And the idea is actually pretty simple. Inside your virtual machine memory, you have something called the balloon and the balloon can inflate or deflate. And all memory that's currently inflated inside of the balloon is not actually usable by the virtual machine, but by the hypervisor instead. That means when we inflate the balloon, uh, we give more memory back to the hypervisor and take it from the virtual machine. And the implement implementation in an operating system is actually also pretty simple. So um, there is a driver running in the virtual machine in the guest operating system, which simply allocates memory, uh, coordinates with the hypervisor, and uh, when it wants to uh, get some me memory back for uh, deflation, it simply frees previously allocated memory after coordinating with the hypervisor. And the whole mechanism, so the size of the balloon is controlled by a so-called target balloon size, which uh, corresponds to a request from the hypervisor towards the virtual machine to change the size of the balloon. Now this idea is pretty neat and uh, it has been used uh, for decades already. And this is also why it has been used for all of the use cases we just saw. Um, so for example, um, when you want to dynamically resize the virtual machine memory, you could dynamically inflate or deflate the balloon. Um, and also for all of the other um, yeah, items I mentioned, you, you, you might be able to use it to some extent. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here because uh, there isn't uh, sufficient time to cover all of the details, but there are a lot of issues. And Michael will talk about uh, at least one issue regarding migration. So um, what do we want to do instead? Um, of course, this is not uh, optimal. So what we see are uh, a plenty of extensions or new mechanisms to make the whole thing work. And uh, one, uh, one part is um, extensions to existing rotor balloon, giving it more interfaces or better suited interfaces to get the job done. And Michael will talk about these. Uh, the other part is um, uh, new mechanisms, new Rodeo devices on one hand, Rodeo PMEM, on the other hand, Rodeo MEM, which I will talk about after um, Michael discussed Rodeo balloon extensions. So let's try to migrate a guest. Consider an example on this slide. We start with an eight gigabyte virtual machine and when migrating it, we inflate a balloon to four gigabytes. And as a result, only four gigabytes need to be migrated. Now, after migration, balloon is deflated. Here we immediately encounter problems. How is the balloon size determined? If we inflate it too much, guest will slow down or have. And if we inflate it too little, then migration will take longer. To address this issue, we can give guests more control over the balloon. And several ideas had to come together to result in our current solution. First, to inflate balloon, we can make it as big as possible to fill up all of free memory. Naturally, guest needs to change. So a second idea is to let guest deflate at any time if that happens. Third idea is that the first thing guest does with a free page is to write some data into it because it's free, so it has nothing in it so far. And this is actually easy for the host to detect, so we can do away with an explicit deflate operation. The last idea is that we do not care about reporting small four kilobyte chunks of free RAM, which are spread all over the guest memory. Modern guests have compaction mechanisms, which can with time help create large free pages an order of multiple megabytes. Let's only inflate with the largest possible chunk of memory that is still tracked by the guest memory management. Now combining these ideas, we get a couple of features which are called free page hinting and free page reporting. Let's look at them in a bit more detail. Free page hinting is an older one of the features. It was contributed by Intel several years ago. It was designed specifically to speed up migration. Here's how it works. Well, it all starts by host, right? Protecting all of its memory. That's normal for migration. Host then sends a request to start free page hinting to the guest. At this point, guest will take all free pages and add them all to the balloon. And host will start processing the pages sent to it, marking, marking them up so they won't be migrated. And also, right, protecting them if not already right protected. Meanwhile, should guest need some free pages, they simply start using them, even as host processes them at the same time. Now, since the first thing that guest does when using a page is write into the page, and since page is write protected, this will cause a fault. And host will mark page for migration again. Now, unsurprisingly, this feature is a good fit for migration has no overhead unless requested. Hypervisor rate tracking is used for migration anyway, so it's easy to reuse. Balloon can shrink without waiting for host to make progress, so guest is not slowing down. On the other hand, it's less than ideal as a solution for memory over commit. Host needs, needs to request it, and it's not clear when is a good time to do it outside migration. Inflating all of free memory can get expensive, should we do it often. Write tracking adds overhead to all guest writes, even to non-free memory. To solve some of these issues, we have free page reporting, which is a newer feature also from Intel. It's designed to solve the 
disadvantages of the hinting. Free page reporting is initiated by guest, which takes action when a significant number of new free pages accumulates. At this point, guest takes some of these pages, by default about 1 16th of the free pages, and adds them to the balloon. Host processes the pages by marking them as free, and then reports that page has been processed to the guest. Now, unlike with hinting, guest then waits for host to process the reported pages before taking them out of the balloon. And again, when page is reused, it is first of all written to, and this causes a fault and memory allocation on the host. Now, this reporting is a good fit for our commit because guest activates it when memory becomes free. Host implementation is also simple. There's no need to play with right tracking, which is easy to get wrong. And we also do not need to track guest writes to use pages, which is often most of guest memory writes. On the other hand, this feature adds overhead to memory intensive workloads at all times, not just during migration. And also shrinking must wait for the host, which can be blocked by host scheduler. So it's less of a good fit for migration. So th these are the two hinting features that we have. Before we move on, I just wanted to mention a sundry list of all the balloon related to the items that we have and some of them we have had for years. First of all, guest free page solutions do not have a way to shrink guest caches like regular and plate does. So we can just bypass the page cache. And this is Virtio Pimeo, which David is going to talk about a little bit later. That's one solution, but what about, for example, application page caches? Also, Balloon still doesn't really support a device pass-through with VFIO. Supporting that is not easy. It needs some, someone who's ready to hack host side of MMU, IMMU drivers. There's also a slew of old balloon interface bugs that no one seems to want to fix. For example, virtual machine memory size with inflate and deflate is very limited. Guest and host page size is assumed to always be four kilobytes, which is not always the case. Out of memory handling is present in Linux, but is under specified and contributions would be most warmly welcome. Okay, let's talk about Virtual PMEM next. So the basic idea of Virtual PMEM is actually pretty simple. Instead of exposing your disk image via Virtual Block or similar towards your virtual machine, instead you map the file directly into a guest physical address space and make the guest access that disk image similar to an NVDIM, so a persistent memory, or also sometimes referred as DAX, like direct access. Um, However, in contrast to a uh, real emulated NVDIM, uh, we get the benefit of flushes or flushing writes to this to actually pro work properly. And we're gonna talk about that in a sec. So if we take a look at our um, guest physical address space, then uh, with Virtual PMEM, we would have our DEX device, meaning our file directly mapped into this address space. And if we compare that to an NVDIM, it's actually pretty sim similar. So the main difference here is that uh, whenever we emulate an NVDIM using a real NVDIM, there is absolutely no issue. But at the point where we would start to emulate an NVDIM for our guest using a file, we would run into issues when wanting to flush um, writes to disk. Um, the nature of NVDIMs work by using only memory flush instructions, so to, for example, flush cache lines and memory fence instructions. And once these instructions were executed, the guest can be sure that everything is persistent. But uh, if we map a file into our VM physical address space, this is no longer the case. So instead, we really have to intercept any kinds of flushes um, to QM, QMU, and in QMU, we have to go ahead and do an F-sync, and only after the F-sync happened, we can be sure that it's actually persistent. And this is very important in case uh, our virtual machine would crash, because if stuff would not be persistent on something that's supposed to be persistent memory, then we're in trouble. So um, 
the, the big idea is to have a paravirtualized mechanism to perform flushes, and this is exactly what Rudolf Piemann does. Uh, and we get on by doing that, we get a benefit of uh, DEX devices, meaning we can bypass the page cache in our guest completely uh, and instead let the page cache for that file be completely managed in the hypervisor. So what are the advantages of Rudolf Pima? Of course, um, we, we move this page cache handling from the guest to the hypervisor. Uh, we free up the guest page cache so the hypervisor can make decisions of when to shrink the page cache just easily. For example, when it's about to run out of memory. Also, it's a safe fileback emulated in VDIM because writes work properly in contrast to using a real emulated NVDIM uh, backed by a file as I mentioned. Also, uh, interestingly, as it's a Rudo device, it's actually an NVDIM-like mechanism, a DEX mechanism, even for architectures that don't even have hardware NVDIMs or um, architectures that don't even have ACPI. So for example, S390X might be feasible in the future. But also there are some disadvantages. Uh, because we map this disk image directly into our VM physical address space, um, we really only support raw disks for now. So no QCO2 or similar. Also because we are using the hypervisor page cache now um, with multiple virtual machines, there are quite some security, but also fairness concerns that at least uh, users have to be aware of. Similar to real NVDIMs, booting is not supported and requires an external kernel or another disk image, which could, for example, be read-only or similar. Also, it's worthwhile to mention that Rudder PMEM is not applicable in all setups. So for example, there are uh, environments where the hypervisor page cache is not involved at all. Imagine passing through a disk directly from your hypervisor to your guest or accessing the disk using some other uh, mediated devices. Also, as soon as we have fairly big disks, this could become an issue. Also, there are still some open items to be sorted out. On the one hand, uh, we want to eventually support other architectures, but also other guest operating systems. As far as I know, currently there is only really Linux support for it. Also in the long term, we want to support other disk image types. And we could actually uh, support something like UCO2 or similar by using some neat user for the FD trickery. Uh, but of course, uh, this is stuff for the future and might require more work to fi figure out how exactly it's gonna be done. There's still uh, one remaining bug that's to be solved, um, which involves pre-flushing, asynchronous flushes in Linux, uh, stuff like that. Uh, long story short, it's work in progress, but uh, as long as that's not upstream, there are some cases where flushes might not uh, actually be persistent yet. Also, uh, we want to see in the future libert integration, live migration support, hot unblock support, and a bunch of optimizations. But until then, Rudder PMEM can be used um, just fine, keeping in mind a couple of things I mentioned. Now let's talk about virtual map. Uh, virtual map can be summarized as a fine-grained NumaVera memory hot unblock mechanism to dynamically resize virtual machines. And the idea is actually pretty simple. So if you take a look at your memory, uh, the memory your virtual machine has available, then you usually have some kind of initial or boot memory, and you can extend that memory using various mechanisms. So for example, you could, you, you could use DIMMs to add more memory to your virtual machine um, or remove DIMMs again by hot unplugging them. Um, but DIMMs have their own set of issues that I'm not gonna uh, go into detail here. Um, VirtualMem is similar. So VirtualMem can extend then your initial VM size uh, on a per node level. And it works by each virtual MEM device providing a flexible amount of memory towards a virtual machine. Uh, internally, this is implemented by um, a device managing a dedicated region in guest uh, physical address space. Uh, it, it can be thought of something like a resizable DIM, but it's uh, more complicated than that. Uh, one interesting fact is that uh, virtual MEM devices 
uh, are not discovered if you're running an unmodified operating system, meaning an operating system that uh, is not aware of Rudelman. Because that allows us to always know which memory uh, a guest is allowed to touch and, for example, later detect malicious guests that might try to make use of more memory than they are actually allowed to. Internally, Rudelman works in a granularity of blocks, for example, two megabyte blocks, but they can be significantly bigger. And uh, a Rudelman device itself has three main properties. On one hand, it has a size which corresponds to the amount of memory a Rudelman device currently provides towards a virtual machine. It has a, also has a maximum size. And the maximum size corresponds to the maximum amount of memory uh, that could be provided via a Rudelman device towards the virtual machine. Last but not least, there is a requested size, uh, which corresponds to a request, a request from the hypervisor towards the guest to uh, change the amount of memory that is consumed via a Rudelman device. And this mechanism allows you to resize uh, a guest in fairly fine-grained steps uh, NUMA aware. And using it is actually not too hard right now. So first of all, you have to prepare your uh, virtual machine for memory devices, just as you would have to for DIMMs and VDIMMs, but also for LP MEM. After that, you create a memory backend, which is later used to um, uh, host your virtual MEM device in your hypervisor. And the size you specify actually corresponds to the maximum size. Then you create your actual virtual MEM device. I, you can assign it to a node and you connect the memory backend. And um, as a default, if you would start your VM, your uh, guest would not consume any additional memory via this virtual MEM device. It will start in consuming more memory as soon as you actually request it. So you can request it, for example, via uh, QMP or HMP in QMU using a uh, Chrome set and Chrome get mechanism. So you could request to um, consume, for example, four gigabytes via that device and the guest will try to make, make, uh, make it possible. And you can always then also observe how much memory the guest is actually consuming via device by querying its current size. So what are advantages and disadvantages? Advantages are obviously that you can re resize a virtual machine in fairly small increments. So right now uh, with uh, Linux gas on x86-64, you can resize in four megabyte granularity. Also, it's significantly more flexible than DIMMs and also significantly more flexible than memory ballooning. For example, memory ballooning does not support NUMA and with DIMMs you have uh, quite some granularity restrictions. Also, but a man is able to manage VM size changes completely inside QMU. So you don't have to mess with any DIMMs or anything else. All you do is you request changes to the size of a MEM device and see what happens. Interestingly, Rudder MEM uh, being all a Rudder O device is also architecture independent. So for example, it does not require ACPI. So it's also applicable to other architectures. Disadvantage are, um, for example, that it's not production ready yet. So we have some basic versions upstream in Linux, GMU and the cloud hypervisor but there are still some things that at least I want to see uh, implemented and fixed uh, before we can consider this production ready and I can sleep good at night. Also, it's slower than memory ballooning and it cannot unplug as much memory as memory ballooning. The thing is that memory ballooning works on the whole virtual machine and not just on restricted uh, physical uh, memory regions inside your virtual machine. And memory ballooning works on 4K granularity usually, while Rudder MEM works on 4 megabyte granularity. Also, currently, it's incompatible with hibernation and suspension, meaning as soon as you have Rudder MEM running with Linux guests, you won't be able to hibernate or suspend your guests anymore. This might change in the future, but might require quite some work. Open items are just as with Rudder or PMEM, for example, support for other architectures, um, ARM64 and S390X, uh, I have prototypes for, but of course, other ones uh, might also be interesting. Guest operating support um, will also be challenging and interesting, for example, to get Windows running with it. There's still quite some open items in the Linux driver, for example, um, 
how much memory you can actually unplug later on um, is not guaranteed yet, but uh, it is work, uh, work in progress. In Inktuem, there are various things that have to be tackled. For example, VFO support, just as for Ruder Balloon, meaning that you can pass through devices and still have uh, this uh, yeah, mechanism to resize the virtual machines this way. Also, other GMU uh, future work would be protecting uh, guest memory um, from um, being accessed again, meaning that a malicious guest does not consume more memory than actually requested via a rudiment device. Uh, also, just as for Voodoo PMEM, Libroot integration would be great to see in the future, uh, especially once it's officially production ready. So to summarize, uh, what we see is we see more specialized mechanisms to manage guest memory. So for example, we talked about the Voodoo balloon extensions uh, to speed up migration or to optimize memory overcommit in the hypervisor. We talked about Ruder PMEM to move the page cache handling to the hypervisor. And we talked about Ruder MEM to resize your guess uh, fine grained and numerical. But it's uh, worth to note that traditional balloon inflation and deflation still remains important. For example, the new mechanisms we see still have to mature. For example, Ruder MEM is still not production ready. Also, um, the, the more, um, yeah, um, memory management uh, um, intensive things we develop, the deeper the memory management integration in our guest actually is. So for example, writing a balloon driver is pretty simple. All you have to do is allocate memory and free memory, essentially. Um, but having Windows support for all of the other features we talked about today will be much more difficult. And so it is with all um, closed source operating systems where we as open source developer cannot really influence um, core memory management. Also in general, there is still a lot to optimize. Uh, as Michael already mentioned, uh, the page, guest page cache still remains challenging. Uh, so are other caches like the application cache, uh, if, if you imagine something like that. Um, for example, uh, PMEM isn't always applicable. Um, and then you essentially are back to the same issue with um, the guest maybe consume all of its main memory just for the page cache. Also encrypted virtual machines remain challenging. Uh, I think this item hasn't really been tackled yet, but it's certainly stuff for the future because the hypervisor isn't really allowed to modify um, content of your virtual machine. Um, so what most of our uh, mechanisms do is they discard, for example, memory um, to optimize, and that is not possible. So it requires some kind of coordination with the guest or with the encrypted VM setup. Um, I think that Ruder balloon inflation and deflation should be feasible. Ruder mem should be feasible. I'm not so sure about Ruder pmem because um, we're mapping some content into our guest, which uh, is unencrypted, and that might be an issue. Also, VFRO and in general, PCI path-through or other path-through remains challenging. Because the issue with VFRO is that it essentially pins all guest memory and forcing it to remain in hypervisor memory. So um, even if you would have Ruder PMEM, this would mean that your whole Ruder PMEM device would be pinned in hypervisor memory, which is not really an improvement to what we have right now. And uh, the same goes for all of the other items. Uh, we do have a prototype for Ruder MEM that makes it work. Um, but uh, I guess a clean solution will still have to require some discussions in the future. And that's basically it for this talk. Thank you a lot for attending. If there are any questions, feel free to uh, ask them in the chat or reach out to either me or Michael. And uh, I'll leave you with that. Um, here are some resources in case you want to learn more, uh, look up stuff, uh, and this is it. Um, I hope you'll have a great time enjoying the rest of KVM Forum 2020.